Uh, Kalispera says. Uh, hello everyone, it's a great pleasure to welcome everyone to the 2023 Nikki Lapis Lecture. And uh, I would like to ask the president of the board of directors, of course, uh, Professor Nectarios Tavernarakis to say a few words about the event. Dear Professor Balbus, uh, dear Professor Tulafis, dear Vasilis, dear colleagues and friends, welcome, good afternoon. On behalf of the Foundation for Research and Technology, it gives me great pleasure to welcome you to the 2023 Tulafis Lecture. I would particularly like to thank Professor Stephen Balbus for agree, who agreed to deliver this year's lecture, which is titled, as you can see, Understanding Black Holes from Stars Destroyed by Tidal Forces. Fourth, and its Institute of Astrophysics has established the Kilafis Lecture Series to honor Professor Nikos Kilafis for his instrumental contributions and continuing commitment towards the development of astrophysics research in Crete and in Greece. The establishment of the Institute of Astrophysics a few years ago at Forth came as a culmination of these efforts. Nikos was a driving force behind the creation of the new institute. Achieving this ambitious objective uh, was not at all a linear process, and it was through Nikos' uh, perseverance that it eventually came to fruition. I remember vividly our long and spirited discussions about how to proceed effectively and our frequent visits and petitions to ministers and government officials. It was an arduous and protracted uh, struggle to convince them about the need and indeed the added value of having a Frontier Research Institute of Astrophysics here in Greece. From the very beginning, special emphasis was placed establishing the new institute based on the same principles and terms of excellence that all four institutes abide to. In point of fact, the institute is already thriving with five of its members having uh, secured prestigious and highly competitive ERC grants. Aiming to foster and further facilitate the pursuit of excellence, Ford has undertaken several concrete initiatives, including the now long tradition of the Onassis Lecture Series, attracting uh, Nobel laureates and outstanding scientists from all over the world. We have also introduced the, the intramural Ford Synergy Grants and the Ford Research uh, Excellence Awards, among others. The Kilafis Lecture Series is coming as a worthy addition in this roster of focused activities. With this opportunity, I would like to congratulate the Institute of Astrophysics and its director, uh, Professor Vasilis Karmandaris, for maintaining the course and organizing the lecture for the fifth time now. I would also like to thank you all for being here today uh, to hear about black holes and the exciting new developments in the field of astrophysics uh, by Professor Balbus. Thank you very much and uh, let's enjoy the lecture. Hello again. I would like to say a few words about our uh, distinguished uh, uh, visitor and speaker. Uh, Professor Balbus is uh, an American who grew up in the east uh, part of the, of, uh, the US. Uh, he went, uh, he studied physics and mathematics at a prestigious institute, which is well known, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. And then uh, like the uh, his forefathers 200 years ago, he decided to cross the, the U.S. and go up back to the East Coast to a small state school, the University of California at Berkeley, where he did extremely well by obtaining his PhD in theoretical astrophysics. And then he moved back to the East Coast, where he went, uh, he spent some time as a postdoc at Princeton University. And then he obtained a faculty position at the University of Virginia, where he became full professor. And at that time, he decided that it would be a good idea to test his patience and cross the Atlantic by moving to France, where he was a professor uh, of excellence in a newly established chair at the prestigious Ecole Normale in Paris, a position that he held from 2004 to 2012. And I think at that time, probably he thought that France was good, but not good enough and the prestigious French chair was not as good as the much more traditional 
and chair that of the civilian professor of astronomy. So he decided to cross the channel and go to Oxford University, where he has been ever since as a civilian professor of astronomy at Oxford. Uh, Professor Balbus has uh, made uh, numerous fundamental contributions in the area of theoretical astrophysics. He is probably mostly well known about the uh, Balbus Foley effect, which uh, he may talk to you about uh, in, uh, in private or maybe touch upon during his uh, lecture. He has received numerous prizes. Uh, he's a fellow of the Royal Society. He received the Eddington Medal of the Royal Society, the Dirac Medal in 2021. The prestigious Shaw Prize, which is uh, for those who do not know it very well, it's also called as the Nobel of the East, which is associated with the Monetary Award, actually associated with it. He is member of Academy of Science and whatnot. So he's, uh, he's very well respected and it is a, really a great pleasure to have him with us, spending a, a few days with us in Crete. And uh, we all hope that he appreciated his visit so that he may come again and spend more time with us in the future. So without further ado, I would like to bring, uh, ask Professor Balbus to come to the audience. And since we know that he, to the podium, and since we know that his lecture will be fantastic, we decided that we we're going to give him some uh, memorabilia from uh, Ford in advance of his lecture. So uh, Professor Tavernarakis may want to come. So as usual, for those who remember, we have two things. One is the simple uh, uh, present, which is uh, basically a diploma, a lecture, which is uh, signed by me. This is how I become famous. I give a piece of paper to that famous astronomer. <laughs> Thank you very much. And, uh, the Thank you. For being here. And uh, Professor Sabanaraki would like to give you a uh, the, oh, wonderful. the signal to, to, to this professor. Uh, it's one of the very earliest uh, printed documents yeah. of uh, humanity. And this, as you yeah. very well know, this is not this has not been deciphered yet, mm -hmm. and we need very bright astronomers uh, to do this. Mm -hmm. We will actually try. So, Professor Valdez is in his spare time over the next few weeks. Mm -hmm. we'll I'll let you know. He'll let yeah. you know. <laughs> Thank you very much for coming. There is also. Uh, a place that we haven't visited, the Sinecas Observatory, our research infrastructure. All these pictures were the coffee table book, not about coffee table book. <laughs> uh, for those of you know, signed, so signed by <laughs> Professor <laughs> Patmos Dorakis, who is the founding uh, director of the observatory. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you, Vasileis and Nick, for what has been a, a truly wonderful week, uh, both personally and uh, professionally. I'm uh, very grateful for the hospitality that I've been shown and very stimulated uh, by my discussions with Institute members. And uh, I look forward to more visits, more collaborations, and uh, more science in the future. Uh, it's really been a, a wonderful experience. So what I'd like to talk about today is an unusual process, which I think is, although it was first proposed oof, perhaps half a century or so ago, uh, is only now becoming part of the astronomical uh, scenery. Uh, it's only now becoming uh, looked at uh, in scientific detail. And this is what happens when a star in a galaxy, and it can, could be at great distances from our own galaxy, when a star in a galaxy comes so close to the central region of its own galaxy that the black hole, which is situated at the center, a very, very massive black hole, actually tears the star apart by its tidal forces, and the remnants that are left over after the star is destroyed and how it feeds on to the black hole can tell us a great deal of information 
about the properties of the black hole that gave rise to its own destruction. So let's talk about what tidal forces are. Let's begin at the beginning. Uh, the ones I guess we're most familiar with, although I guess if you live in the middle of the Mediterranean, you don't actually have tides. The actual tides themselves are very small. But if you go off in an island in the ocean, the tides can be much larger. And they arise because in the case of the Earth and the Moon, the Moon pulls on the Earth, and the Earth pulls on its on the Moon, these are on opposite forces. But if we look at the Moon's force on the Earth, the actual balance is an exact balance only right very near the center of the Earth. If I look at what is happening on the near side of the Earth, then I'm a little bit closer to the Moon, the tidal forces are a little bit larger. If I look on the back side of the Earth, because of the Earth's orbit around the Moon and the Moon's orbit around the Earth, there are centrifugal forces, rotational forces, which tend to push, in this case, the oceans much more easily than the land, it tends to push the oceans out a little bit. So as you see in the bottom picture, there's an arrow pointing opposite from the moon. Uh, or in the top picture, you, you see the arrow is directed toward the moon, but a little bit less than the arrow which is in front of the Earth. And if I look at it in the, in the bottom picture, in the frame in which the forces balance right at the center, what that actually does is it gives you a repulsive force on the other side of the moon. And then on the top of the picture and the bottom of the picture, the tidal forces are squeezing the Earth in such a way that its volume remains constant even as it's being distorted by the tidal forces. And then there's a much more carefully drawn picture on the right there, which shows the shape of the tidal forces as felt by somebody on the Earth due to the moon. So there's this continuous distortion. Exactly the same process happens when a star gets too close to the central black hole of a galaxy. Now, in the days when black holes were truly novel and not at all widely accepted, uh, the late 60s and the early 70s, people were trying to think of all kinds of unusual processes that might happen around black holes. It was still kind of a novel idea. And people came up with this term, I think this is a, a John Wheeler term, professor at Princeton who actually coined the name black hole, came up with this notion of spaghettification. That is to say, if you get too close to a black hole, the same tidal forces become so enormous. Well, here we have it illustrated with this hapless astronaut who has come too close to a black hole. And so the sense of, you get a sense of the distortion. There are enormous forces which are elongating the objects that come too close to a black hole because of the enormous gravity. But the physics is basically the same as what I've just shown you before of the interacting Earth Moon system. Um, so what happens, of course, in reality is not this sort of humorous distortion, but an actual physical disruption of the star if it gets too close. But the main reason I wanted to show this is that this is not a new idea in principle. This is something which is half a century old, at least the conceptualization of what goes on near a black hole. Now, I'm a physicist, so I'm going to show you a couple of equations. Uh, so I assume most people in the audience have seen some basic mechanics, so I hope this isn't too scary, but I'll walk you through it. So the top equation is simply an equation which says that the acceleration, the force per unit mass due to a central 
gravitating mass is given by this formula you see on the right, G m over r squared, where g is the Newtonian gravitational constant, m is the mass of the central object, and r is the distance between the central object and the test mass that we're interested in studying. So that equation is mathematically equivalent to the equation below it, the same mathematics that's involved, but you can write it in the form of an energy equation. And what we have are two terms on the left side after we integrate the equation in terms of calculus. The first term is a kinetic energy term, one half the velocity squared, the kinetic energy per unit mass, plus a potential energy term, minus gm over r, and that is equal on the far side to a constant, the energy constant. And that's the sort of fundamental equation. And it looks like I'm using entirely standard Newtonian physics here. But actually, the equation that I've written down, interestingly enough, is also valid in full general relativity, provided that that tau, the d by the, the d tau, the time that I'm measuring when I calculate my velocity, the time on that, because in relativity, time changes depending upon the observer who's actually looking at what is happening. So that time is the time on the wristwatch of somebody who's falling into the black hole itself. So you have to use that time for the equation to be okay. And you have to be on a precisely, exactly radial orbit. And under those circumstances, I can write this equation as d squared over two, that's the kinetic energy, minus gm over r, that's the so-called potential energy, and that's equal to the total energy, which remains constant as an object falls into a black hole. And I emphasize that really is the correct equation for a black hole attracting an object on a radial path with no angular momentum. So if I consider the problem where I drop a mass from rest a very long distance away, then the velocity that I start off with is tiny, essentially zero, and then gm over r, I'm a long distance away, r is practically infinite, so gm over r is zero, so e in this problem is zero, and it stays that at that value throughout the entire fall into the black hole. So if I ask myself the question, if E is zero always, V is going up, R is going down, at what location would my velocity equal the speed of light? Well, that's not too difficult to work out. We call that radial location the Schwarzschild radius, Rx. And that's given by 2gm over c squared. So here is this not too difficult calculation done in detail. d squared over 2 is minus gm over r. I set the velocity equal to c, the speed of light. I set r equal to r sub s. It's called the Schwarzschild radius. Then it's straightforward to see that that value is 2gm over c squared. So that turns out to be a very special and a very important radius that is associated with the black hole. As you've seen, it's the radius at which an object dropped from rest a very long distance away would acquire the velocity of the speed of light as measured by a clock that's moving with the person the individual, the mass that's headed toward the center of the black hole. So R sub S is going to be an important number, the Schwarzschild radius in our problem. What are some numerical values? Well, if I tried to evaluate that for the Earth, it would be nine millimeters, gm, 2gm 
over T squared. If I evaluated it for the sun, it would be about three kilometers. About the size of Heraklion, I'm guessing. You'd have to take the entire mass of the sun and put it inside Heraklion in order to have R sub S, the Schwarzschild radius, outside of the mass. If I ask, and this is a more representative example of what happens, if I ask for what mass would correspond to a Schwarzschild radius of one AU, one astronomical unit, the distance from the Earth to the sun, that number would be a mass of 50 million times the mass of the sun. So the sun would have to be 50 million times larger to get its Schwarzschild radius out to the location of the Earth's orbit. Now, the Earth, of course, is much bigger than nine millimeters. You've noticed. The sun is much bigger than Heraklion, much bigger than three kilometers. But the mass in the center of our galaxy, which we now know is about four million solar masses, is actually a lot smaller than its Schwarzschild radius, which would be 0 0.08 astronomical units, about one tenth of the distance between the Earth and the Sun. And that's what we call a black hole. If I can manage to get the mass of an object, smaller than a Schwarzschild radius, then that shows itself to astronomers as a black hole. That's the name we give it. A black hole forms when a star or any kind of collection of matter, could be anything, it collapses so that it lies completely within a sphere of surface area four pi r squared s. That's actually a better way to describe a black hole because when you get things so squeezed, you're actually distorting the radial direction. So that's a more accurate statement to make. The surface area is that of a sphere of r sub s, 4 pi r squared s. Once I get within a sphere of that surface area, I I collect all the mass so that it lies within a sphere of area 4 pi r squared s. There's actually nothing in physics. There is no way to stop the material from collapsing down literally to a single mathematical point. And that's the astonishing fact about a black hole and why for so many, for such a long time, throughout the 60s and 70s even, uh, it was regarded as kind of fanciful. It wouldn't really go down to a single mathematical point, would it? Well, that's what the theory itself predicts. And in fact, because R sub S is so special, the Schwarzschild radius, it ha has, goes by another name. It's called the event horizon. And the region when my radius is smaller than R sub S, uh, is smaller than R sub S, that region of space is cut off from the external universe. There's no way to communicate back and forth, which is why we give it the name, the horizon. There's no way to communicate inside that region from outside the region. In essence, signals from within the Schwarzschild radius would have to travel faster than the speed of light in order to escape from the region. And that can't happen. So all matter within R less than the Schwarzschild radius R sub S will eventually reach R equals zero and form what mathematicians like to call a singularity, a point of infinite density. Now, the study of this is very much uh, 
a 20th century uh, enterprise and the first people to actually work this out in detail, to actually calculate with the machinery of general relativity, the formation of a black hole from a distributed uh, pattern of mass from a finite region down to a single point. This was first done in 1939 by Robert Oppenheimer, who has now become a movie star, of course, and will be well known to almost uh, all, uh, all people who follow Hollywood. It's the same Oppenheimer and his student Hartman Snyder in 1939. The calculation they did was perfectly spherically symmetric, which made it possible to do. But it had a very, very high degree of symmetry, and people doubted that a real star would be described by that kind of evolution, something that was exactly spherical. But Roger Penrose, professor at Oxford, the Ralph Ball Professor of Mathematics, people who's retired now, uh, but in 1965, so about well, 26 years after Oppenheimer and Snyder, gave a very beautiful argument, and actually a very powerful mathematical argument that showed that departures from spherical symmetry actually do not prevent gravitational collapse down to a singularity. That it is still possible, even when you abandon the assumption of spherical symmetry, provided you collapse far enough, provided that you get to a region which is of order the size of the Schwarzschild radius, it doesn't matter. Really, 1965 marks the beginning of when black holes suddenly started to be taken seriously as actual physical gravitating objects which we can find in the universe. Here's a picture of how mathematicians like to represent a black hole. They do it in terms of what's called a Penrose diagram. It's not too hard to see what's going on here. The idea is that I have time running along the vertical axis, and I have just a two-dimensional representation of the space. So this ring at the bottom represents collapsing matter. And then as I go up in time, you can see the ring is drawing closer together as the material collapses. And then at some point where you see black hole form, that ring there corresponds to a radius of one Schwarzschild radius, R sub S. At that point, you see the appearance of the event horizon. And once it's created, it doesn't go away it's there forever. And then eventually, the singularity appears when the material has collapsed down to a single mathematical point. Would you like to see a real black hole? Let's see if I can do this. So let's look at an actual, the orbit around the black hole in the center of the galaxy. So this is a movie made by Andrea Gez. And Andrea Gez and Reinhard Genzel won the Nobel Prize in Physics in 2020 for this work, which firmly established the existence of a black hole at the center of our galaxy. And what you're looking at here are actual orbits of stars that have been observed and their orbits reconstructed. You can see, it's amazing. We now have the telescopes and the technology that we can see individual stars right at the center of our galaxy. And we can see the orbits that they're on. And if you can see an orbit, you know everything there is to know about the central mass, which is allowing the star to orbit in the first place. And that's how we know, by looking at all these stars, that there is a black hole at the center of the galaxy of about 4 million times the mass of the sun. 
Now, I want to make a point. You might think that it requires really unusual conditions to make a black hole. We don't see them every day, after all. And if you take, you want to make the Earth and turn it into something which is as big as your thumbnail, which you have to do, it's not so obvious how you do it. But look, space is big, and that's a big help. It's easier to make a black hole than you might think. I just have to get something which is within the size of its Schwarzschild radius. So how do the numbers work out? And what about if I wanted to make a black hole from water? If I could somehow fill up the solar system from the sun out to the middle of the asteroid belt. Now, it's not trivial to do, but it's conceivable. I don't need ultra high density and I don't need inconceivably large distances. If water were to fill up, somebody left the tap running and all the water went out, filled up the solar system out to the middle of the asteroid belt, that would be sufficient mass to collapse to a black hole and nothing could prevent it. If water is already too dense, what about if I took air? What about if I took air at the density of the atmosphere in this room? Well, all I would need to do in that case is to fill up the solar system out to the middle of the Kuiper belt, which is another collection of solar system debris. Instead of being between Mars and Jupiter, the Kuiper belt is beyond the orbit of Neptune, the farthest planet in the solar system. It's about 75 astronomical units, 75 times the distance from the Earth to the sun. Just the ordinary air under those circumstances would collapse to form a black hole. So in the end, it now looks like the universe and our galaxy is full of these amazing objects. Now, black holes have unusual properties. I've told you that if somebody, an observer, has the misfortune to be falling into a black hole, they'll reach the singularity in a finite amount of time. On the other hand, viewed by an observer a long distance away, safely viewing the infall through a telescope, time would seem to run more slowly. We'll come back to that point a little bit later as the collapse proceeds. And it takes from the point of view of an external observer, it takes an infinite amount of time before one actually reaches the Schwarzschild radius as viewed from somebody on the outside. When Oppenheimer and Snyder, the first people who found this, uncovered this result, it was bizarre. They hadn't ever, nobody had ever seen anything like that kind of a difference in the way time unfolded. One person, the person who's falling into the center, it takes a couple of hours for them to reach the singularity. From the point of view of somebody from the outside, they never actually cross R sub S. How was that even possible? Well, there's no contradiction there. That is entirely consistent with the laws of physics. And indeed, somebody from the outside sees the object hung up at the Schwarzschild radius. The Russians, when they first studied black holes, before they were called black holes, referred to them as frozen stars for this reason. They seem to be frozen from the point of view of an external observer at the Schwarzschild radius. Whoops, let me go back. As I say, by contrast, viewed by a co-moving observer, time runs normally as material falls to within the Schwarzschild radius and then continues all the way down to the singularity itself. 
So I'm going to take a moment now to describe how astronomers measure the time de delays. They do that by measuring what's known as a redshift. You're probably familiar with the idea here that an object which is moving away from you, if it's emitting sound, the wavelength of the sound is extended by the velocity. And we define this ratio Z, which is the wavelength of the observed signal minus the wavelength that the signal or the sound in this case would have in the rest frame of the object that's emitting it, divided by that same wavelength in the rest frame. That ratio is known as the redshift. And astronomers measure redshifts very accurately, not with sound, of course, but with light. And what I've described here is a kinematic redshift, the redshift which occurs because of the motion of the object itself. It is redshifted to an observer on the right, looking at an object moving towards the left, the wavelengths are extended. The redshift is actually a blue shift for an observer observing the object moving towards it with a negative velocity. Now, interestingly enough, in Einstein's theory of relativity, signals from a stationary object can be redshifted. You don't need motion. Gravity itself can cause a redshift. Time runs more slowly, effectively, in a gravitational field. So here's a signal coming from an object being measured. I guess that's supposed to be the Earth in this diagram. And the object is written as blue here and red here because indeed as it moves out of the gravitational field, the wavelengths get longer and longer. In a sense, what is really happening, or you are free to regard it as the photon losing energy as it climbs out of the gravitational field of the object from which it originated. And that can be a dominant effect for something like black holes. So here's an actual calculation. Doesn't look like I plotted anything. But that black line is not sort of the boundary of the action. That's an actual mathematical function. And that is a plot, as it says, of the electromagnetic radiation transmitted from the collapse of an object. It is Doppler shifted to the red at first by a tiny amount, and then all of a sudden by an infinite amount as a, the object itself reaches the Schwarzschild radius. So there is the redshift from the surface of, let's say, a dust cloud of mass one solar mass, one times the mass of, as a function of time. Now, the units here are kind of funny. This is roughly, in my calculation, this is an exact result. This is about seven seconds, six seconds, five seconds. It turns out that, that you can read that as one second. And in fact, this bottom portion of the graph shows that while the collapse is going on, there's hardly any redshift at all. It's given by ordinary standard Newtonian physics. There it really is like the collapse of a moving object. Then all of a sudden, when I get very near the Schwarzschild radius, well, right, for many hours, the redshift is tiny and is well described by classical physics and is caused entirely by the motion of the object. Then, in the last 20 seconds, when I'm very close to the Schwarzschild radius, all of a sudden, the redshift becomes enormous. It literally explodes in microseconds and becomes so highly redshifted that no actual physical instrument could possibly record all the radiation. And in fact, it continues to go up without bound. So that's how it would, it would look. If this, you were to watch the sun form a black hole for many hours, 
the redshift would be tiny, and then in 20, 30, 40 microseconds, it would disappear from view because the redshift would become so enormous. So it's a it's an incredible result, a, a really remarkable result. So let's get back now and talk about spaghettification and black holes. So here's a film that was produced by NASA for one of its satellites that was looking for what are called transitory events, events that last only a microsecond. And this is a view of a star coming close to a black hole being disrupted by tidal forces. You can see the star is blown apart. About half the star is, manages to escape. And then the other half of the star or so remain, remains bound to the black hole and forms an accretion disk. It forms a disk of material which surrounds the black hole. And that's what we're going to study. That's how we're going to learn about what kind of a black hole is there. So in some galaxies, galaxies that are, of course, much more distant than our own, in our own galaxy, we're lucky. We can see individual stars. And so we can learn about what kind of a black hole we have in the center of our own galaxy. For external galaxies, we can't see individual stars. There's no possible way we can do that. But if we get lucky and the universe has lots and lots and lots of galaxies and these tidal disruption events as they are called are enormously bright so we can see them across the universe so that is a way to study black holes in very distant galaxies in some cases it's the only way to study the black hole in that kind of a distant galaxy, which is why these tidal disruption events are so interesting to astronomers. So let me tell you a little bit about the theory of the disk. That's the remnant of the star. Or here, the disk could come from anywhere. Normally, it happens in binary star systems where you can have one of the members be a black hole. The other is an ordinary star, and it can donate some of its mass, and it forms a disk around the black hole. It has to form a disk because angular momentum is conserved. The normal star and the black hole are rotating around one another, and you can't get rid of that angular momentum. It has to form a disk, and then somehow, through some process, I have actually worked on a while ago what that process is, the gas in the disk becomes very turbulent and the angular momentum eventually from the inner part transfers to the outer part of the disk and the material can eventually spiral in. And people studied accretion disks for many, many years before they studied these tidal disruption events because they realized that these disks were the best way to learn about what black holes are doing. And we're hoping that if there were black holes, you could see disks of material around it. So the struggle was to understand the physics of that accretion disk so that you could learn something about the black hole. Unfortunately, it turns out that accretion disks, much of the time, could be about as complicated as the black hole itself. So it was a bit of a frustrating task, but with time a theory developed, and now we have a fairly good idea of how these disks behave. And in fact, the person largely responsible for our understanding of how disks behave around black holes, once all the time dependence is gone in a steady state disk, was Nicholas Shapura and Rashid Sanyayev, so-called Shapura Sanyayev disks. And Rashid Sanyayev, I think, is no stranger uh, to the Kalafis lecture. He was your first uh, and uh, very distinguished speaker. And among the many contributions he has made uh, to theoretical astrophysics, his development of Nikolai Shapura of accretion disk theory is a major, major 
contribution. So the disks that we'll be looking at are very thin. These are disks in which pressure support plays no role at all in their structure. Basically, gravity is pulling them in it's like a planet going around the sun. The disk itself is supported by its rotation. Now, in the vertical direction, there it's different. There, pressure support is the only kind of support you have for making the disk infinitely thin. So that doesn't happen. But the disk, nevertheless, is still very thin. That is to say, the radial extent compared to the height is a very large ratio. A R over H is large, H over R is small. Here's a more detailed picture. If I have a black hole and I have some point in the disk, the GR, that is the vector of the radial gravitational field. GZ is the component of the vector G, which you see is a hypotenuse of that triangle. And GZ is much less than GR for the same reason in this diagram that the height H is a small fraction of R. Those are similar triangles. So those are the kinds of objects which we can analyze in some detail. So I'm interested when I study tidal disruption events, I don't want steady state theory. I want a time dependent theory. I want to know how these disks will change with time. One of the reasons that these disks are so interesting is that they form around a very massive black hole. Black holes in the centers of galaxies, they're not one or 10 or a hundred times the mass of the sun. They're a million or 10 million or a hundred million times the mass of the sun. And normally the kinds of objects astronomers study when they look at disks, those are very large disks. And they're more or less now the time dependence is gone. It's all steady state. But in the tidal disruption event, the entire process is determined by time dependent effects. The Newtonian theory of time dependent disks was developed in a classic paper by Donald Lindsay and Ben Pringle, 1974. The relativistic steady state theory what happens in a disk around a black hole in full general relativity was developed about the same time by Igor Novikov and Kip Thorne in 1973, Don Page and Kip Thorne in a follow up paper in 74. But relativistic time dependent theory, which is important for my problem, didn't seem to appear anywhere in the literature when I started to look at it. I looked and looked and looked and looked. I, I saw None of the textbooks, and there are lots of textbooks written on this, none of the papers, nowhere to be found. I said, all right, I'll do it. So I worked through, developed a time dependent theory, and that was kind of a mess. You have to what you have to keep track of what time you're talking about. There's observer's time, there's somebody who told me to look at this, there's their time. But I was proud of myself and I worked it all out, and the publisher and the referee said, Oh, good job, you know. Well done, et cetera, et cetera. And then at a conference, somebody said, oh, by the way, this was done in 1975. So, well, this is one of the things, sometimes this happens with research. And interestingly enough, two people here, Dr. Edley, Alan Martin, these were very prominent issues. And I dug out the paper. The paper had nothing to do with relativistic accretion data. They were interested in what happens to magnetic fields in this. And I know, because I worked on it, they got that part wrong. They missed the fact, and now I can you know, expand a little bit about what Vasileus was saying. What happens in an accretion disk when you have a magnetic field is that it becomes unstable. It's a little bit like trying to have two masses rotate around each other when they're connected by a weak spring. That's what magnetic forces do. You can't do it. They couple to one another, they fly apart. The whole thing is unstable. Anyway, in this case, they have a very elaborate theory, assuming it wasn't unstable. So that's all wrong. But what they got right 
was in Appendix 5 of the paper, where they, for some reason, just state the result. No derivation. They just wrote down the answer. And, well, look, at the very least, I could take my result, see what their result was, and we were consistent with one another when we both went into the same board. So I knew at least I had got it right. But credit is due to early enlightenment, although, you know, when I discovered it, they discovered it. All right. What does the equation look like? Well, it's kind of an interesting equation. I'm going to do a little bit of mathematics here, but you don't necessarily have to follow every detail to kind of get the gist of what I'm saying. So I'm setting up my coordinates. There's the radial coordinate R, the angular coordinate phi, and the Z coordinate. And here they are against a disk. And this is what the equation looks like. So it looks a little scary, but I'll talk you through it. So sigma here is the surface density of the disk. And on the left side, that notation means how fast does the surface density change with the time? On the right side, you see sigma appearing. So it's being on the right side. And there, the d by dr refers to how fast is the surface density of that other stuff, how fast are they changing with Position. And it's an interesting equation because on the left side you have one differentiation, one d by dt. And on the right side you notice that you're looking at the differentiation twice. What that means mathematically is that you're looking at a diffusion equation. This is the kind of equation that would describe how one kind of a contaminant in air would diffuse throughout the room if you just put it in one spot and let it change with time. And this is telling us how an accretion disk will spread with time. Now, the two things you have to pay attention to, one is this WR5. Now, that's kind of a complicated thing. That's the bit that says the disk is turbulent. It's not so turbulent that it completely destroys the orbit. The circular orbits are there, but the orbits are wiggling a little bit. They're wiggling in and out, up and down, back and forth. And how those wiggles cooperate with one another tells you how fast angular momentum is going to diffuse through the disk. That's what that WR5 measures. It's an angular momentum diffusion coefficient. And there, theorists to this day sort of have to make educated guesses. That's not something we can really derive yet from first principles. But we can test it with numerical experiments and we have some idea of what it looks like. That's not the thing that's going to stop us from making progress. And this bit here, R squared omega prime, what that is, Omega is the angular velocity. How many revolutions per second am I doing? If I multiply that twice by the radius, that tells me the angular momentum. And that little sign there, that says how fast is the angular momentum changing with radius? That's the gradient is the angular momentum of a circular orbit with if I go a little farther out, how much more angular momentum is there in the orbit? And what's interesting about that R squared omega for something like Newtonian physics, there is more angular momentum in orbits that are farther out, and that means R squared omega prime, the rate at which the angular momentum changes, is a positive quantity which really means this is a real diffusion equation, it'll start to spread. If it's for some reason, R squared omega prime, that rate of change was negative, if there was less angular momentum farther out, that would mess up the whole equation. That would make it completely unstable. 
And the interesting thing is in Newtonian physics, that never happens. This is a good refuting equation. R squared, the angular momentum is always increasing outward. But in general relativity, R squared omega can change fine when you get near a black hole. So that equation suddenly becomes very interesting. So here's what the solutions look like. And the main thing is just to notice how they spread. So this big dot in the surface density of the disk is very narrowly located in a ring. And then I let it evolve and the turbulence makes it spread with time. And it's kind of interesting because parts of the disk, most of the time, parts of it are headed in and then parts of it are headed out. The parts that are headed in have lost their angular momentum. The parts that, have had, that are headed out have acquired the angular momentum. They're moving farther out. And that's the way the disk behaves. More and more of it in time tends to drift and spiral inward, and less and less of it is being pushed outward. Until finally, in the as time goes to infinity, you have all of the material, this is in Newtonian physics, all of the material going to the center with none of the angular momentum, and the entire content of the disk's angular momentum has been sent out to infinity with just a teeny tiny amount of mass manages to acquire. That's how disks evolve. Here's a plot of the angular momentum for a Newtonian disk. You see it's always increasing outward. In general relativity, for most of the time, it looks very Newtonian. But when you get close to the black hole, so this, that six represents three fourths of the rate of Three times two dm over t squared. That's where it turns around. And the accretion disk has a very, very different character inside the innermost stable circular orbit. The circular orbit of which the disk is made, they break down once you're inside this location. And so that's what makes it an interesting problem to try to understand. Our motivation here for studying this equation in detail is to understand these tidal disruption candidates, as we like to call them. The passage of a star through the disruption zone of a massive black hole, which we saw the film for, and these stars are located at the centers of galaxies. Reese, Martin Reese, was the first person to look at the details of this. And he, Martin Reese, actually was the first person to develop some kind of a theory. He wasn't thinking of this, although he should have been, but he wasn't. He was arguing that the luminosity, astronomers call it the bolometric luminosity, that just means the luminosity in all different wavelengths. He hypothesized would be proportional to dmdt, the rate of change of mass, how fast is mass per unit time falling back on the disk. And so he went through a series of steps saying, well, if I write the change in mass with respect to time and the change in mass with respect to energy E, and then the change in energy with respect to R, and then the change of R to position with respect to time, now imagine the material being drawn in, just falling on to the center. And he assumed that there would be an equal amount of mass in an equal energy interval, so dmdt. That was a constant. And then since the energy was proportional to one over r, he argued that dedr was proportional to one over r squared. The RDT, which from Keplerian motion as I move inward, is proportional to one over the square root. That would go like R to the minus five half 
final step was that basically the material when it came in would fall like a power law with time. They would go like T to the minus five thirds. So a tidal disruption event, when you looked at the light that emerged from it, ought to be a power law with a very distinctive index. The light should fall off like T to the minus five thirds. Well, when the astronomers looked at these events in detail, they didn't find that five thirds. They found something that was falling off a lot less fast. Models of disks came in, and in 1990, there was a paper by Canuso, Lee, and Goodman who showed that the luminosity of an accretion disk, an evolving accretion disk with time, would have that peculiar looking power. That's about minus 1.2 instead of minus 1.67. And that was a particular model. We don't need to go into the details where the light was scattered by electrons, et cetera, et cetera. But the point is that when a disk forms, you don't get the same result. And in general, these sorts of power laws are not good descriptions for the X-ray emissions from tidal disruption events. What happens when we try and confront a theory with observation? Well, we like to look at what is coming off of the disk? How much energy at each wavelength? Because it will turn out that how a disk looks depends an awful lot of precisely what wavelength you're looking at. So astronomers speak of wavelength filters, band maps. But what we're looking at here, and what's interesting, is exactly what portion of the spectrum should we study and what would we expect? What would we expect in the optical light? What would we expect in x-rays? And here, that's a difficult problem. So that's funny. I'm going to go back to that picture, which somehow didn't get reproduced here uh, because it looks like some of the, the fonts didn't come when you transcribe it. This is supposed to be X, Y, and Z, and that is the disk. And then you have, it looks like a check mark, and OBX. That was supposed to be a gamma observed. That's an angle down from the Z axis. And then the, I think the eyeball came out. So there is the eyeball, and the beta is the plane of the observer. So we need to translate between the plane of the observer, there's a beta, and that was supposed to be thing that looks like a little upside down cup. That's alpha. So alpha and beta, those are the coordinates of the observer looking through the telescope, and X and Y are the coordinates on the disk, and we need to translate that. And that becomes a complicated mathematical problem because the photons don't even go into straight lines. So if you want to work out what happens, you have a rather complicated looking camera. I won't take you through the full detail, but basically, you have to sum up the emission from all different regions of the disk when the temperature is in strong position the strong function of position, and it occurs in this rather complicated way. We're basically assuming that the radiation is in equilibrium with the material in the disk at a given temperature, but that temperature can change depending upon where you are in the disk. So this is an example of what the mathematical function will look like for a particularly simple kind of disk model. So that could be a capital R. And it goes like T to the fourth, goes like one over R cubed. It's R star is the innermost portion of the disk. That's typically what you have to do. And the point is 
If you set the problem up mathematically, you're by far the hottest, right here in the innermost edge of the disk. And what that means is that instead of having a complicated mathematical problem, you have a simpler mathematical problem. You can look at what's going on very, very locally when you look at X-rays, because all of the X-rays are coming from a tiny little region of the disk. And that's what enables you to actually make progress and solve this analytically. And when you do that, what you find is that this represents the X-ray clock. T is the time, and T0 and Tx are just two different constants, which depend upon the details of the model and which can be fit from the data itself. And N there is an index which comes from your theory of turbulence. Fortunately, N doesn't vary very much. It's going to be a number between about 0.8 and 1.2. The point that you should take home here is that the X-ray plot is in fact a power law times an exponential. And that should be very general behavior from a tidal disruption event if you look at it in the X-ray. But what does it look like when you actually apply it to the theory? Well, here's a real tidal disruption event. Fraction 14 LI. So I think this is something like an automated uh, supernova search. I guess it's the acronym, but it's a nice section title. The fraction 14 LI, the source is 14 LI. And those points are the, are the actual X rays which are measured. And we have two different curves. One is power law, which is fit in the early time after the tidal disruption event. The green is a pure exponential fashion fit in the early time. And then the blue is our model, the model that I just described to you, which is fit at early times and then extended out. And as you can see, it's the late time that you want to get left. Power law is way too high. The exponential is far too small. That's a, that's a logarithmic plot to be the big difference. But the actual detailed model from what we calculate from a disk is extremely accurate. So if we fit the X rays and then we look at another portion of the spectrum, namely the ultraviolet. The ultraviolet, you don't fit these. These are our predictions. And the predictions go exactly through the data point. If what we have is an evolving disk. So something is right about the theory. We are looking at a disk which is changing with time. These are three different, very sharply defined filters for looking in the ultraviolet, and they reproduce the data extremely well. The beginning here, we shouldn't count. There we just, nobody knows, that's the beginning of the car wreck, just after the star has crashed into the black hole. And that seems to be an exponential fall off, but that's added in by hand. The actual prediction this red line, the blue line, and the green line, they start out, and those go through the data point. So why is that? Why does that work so well? So here you see, this is the entire spectrum of the disk. There's the plot, and these are the frequencies this is where the X rays are, the mid portion. And the X rays, as the time goes on, they get smaller and smaller portion of them are occurring in the actual observational band. What you see for the ultraviolet is the blue, the red, and the green. And if you zero in on what is happening there, as the disk spectrum changes, 
you see it's hardly moving at all. The peak of the disk is moving toward the left, but the overall pattern is going down with time and that exactly compensates. And so there's very little change when you zero in and look at the detail. So that's the beauty of these disk models. It's the only model which can reproduce both the X-rays and the ultraviolet portions of the spectrum with a single fit, with a single model. And here are the final parameters that we can deduce by looking at the details and how rapidly the spectrum is changing and what kind of a fit do we get for both the X-rays and the ultraviolet. We can determine the mass of the central black hole, 1.8 times 10 to the six solar masses for this galaxy, which is very close to what observers have used by using very, very different techniques. You can also measure the mass of a black hole by looking very near the center of the galaxy and by how fast the stars are spreading out and doing their random velocities as a way that it's the analog of what Andrea Ghez did in the movie that I showed you, but now for the random motions of stars. And they had a mass for that galaxy and our mass actually agrees very well with it. We can measure in principle the spin of the black hole. One is the maximum that is predicted. We find a value of 0.75 and the units there are basically mass times the speed of light. And so even the mass of the disk can be determined, although not particularly well lively, it's about two hundredths of a solar mass. So only a little bit of the star has been left over probably from the calculation itself. And I'm gonna close, I'm kind of running out of time, but just to show you why these methods are believing it. Here is what astronomers love to do this kind of thing. They love to plot something against something else and draw straight lines. You get very far if you're good at that and you do astronomy. So here, this is the mass of the host galaxy on this axis, and this is the mass of the central black hole. And you can measure the mass of the black hole by, for example, looking at how fast stars are moving near the center of the galaxy. And you can measure the mass of the galaxy in standard rays by looking at rotation curves and stars. And the gray in these standard astronomical methods that have been used to determine that. And the blue are values that we got from looking at tidal disruption events. And if we're on to something, those should be the same population. And you can see, you can't really tell where one begins and the other ends. And the nice thing is that there are lots of blue points down here, relatively few gray points, because it's very difficult to use standard methods down for small mass galaxies and small mass black holes. And people are very interested in this because they want to know what is the black hole population in the universe? There's all kinds of reasons why that's an interesting number to determine. And so this is a way perhaps of getting at these low mass black holes at the centers of galaxies. And this is simply another curve where you measure the mass of the black hole versus the land of velocity of the stars. And the story is much the same. All right, so I'm going to draw my talk to a conclusion. I had another talk. Well, another talk. I had another part of the talk where I was going to tell you about orbits inside the ISCO, but I'm running short of time. So allow me to quickly run to my conclusion. I'm going to not wear my, my welcome. Oh, yeah, that was too much. To conclude, tidal disruption events. TDEs are an interesting laboratory to test the dynamics of classical accretion disk theory. These are small, rapidly evolving disks around large black holes, and it's a way to look for low mass black holes at the centers of galaxies. 
general relativity disks violate the stable angular momentum criterion. General relativity disks have interesting regions where the circular orbits aren't even stable. And it's actually possible to do something there as well. The question definitely that people are interested in. But uh, there's interesting physics to be extracted there inside the ISCO, the innermost stable circular orbit. It's possible to develop an analytic theory of what the X-ray emission should be from the disk and the ultraviolet emission. The X-ray, this part of the spectrum as the disk evolves, there are fewer and fewer X-ray sheets and those cut off very sharply. Whereas the very narrow filter in the ultraviolet, those can remain almost unchanging with time over a period of a year or more. So very different behavior between the ultraviolet and the X-ray, even though we're talking about one object, the disk itself. It does very well. The theory does well with observations with relatively simple assumptions. So I think we're on to something here. And this was the second part of the talk, which that the behavior of disks inside the ISCO is, looks to be relatively simple in terms of what the radial velocity is for something which falls off the innermost stable circular orbit and spirals in. That turns out to be more simple than it had any right to be. I'll have to leave you with that tantalizing statement for the moment. And let me just conclude by saying that there is still interesting fully relativistic dynamics to be done with a pencil, a paper, and I guess if you push me, well, maybe a laptop yeah, as well. But you don't have to run to huge codes to actually do interesting physics, not even today. And I think at that point, I will say thank you. And Well, thank you very much for this very interesting talk. And uh, if there are any questions from our speaker, please feel free to. I come up. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Stephen, for a wonderful talk. Uh, uh, you started very smoothly and took us to the very, very uh, front line of research. Thank you. Uh, as you know, there is a tension regarding the spin of the black holes. And the tension in our community comes from the fact that people that determine the spin from the accretion disk um, uh, conclude the accretion disk that arrives all the way to the ISCO, conclude that the spin of the black hole is high, very high. On the other hand, from gravitational waves, the spin that is inferred is significantly lower. Now, you're an expert on disks. Uh, I, I would say, and sorry about this, that I consider gravitational waves a cleaner problem than accretion disks. What is your feeling? I agree. So that is a, that's a really interesting question. And one of the things that I glossed over in the talk, simply because of time constraints and sort of too much to get in all at once, is what is the inner boundary condition <laughs> that you need to apply when you look at an accretion disk and it has an ISCO? And what people almost always do is they say when you hit that last innermost stable circular orbit, boom, from there you stream in. So in particular, when you look at something called the stress, the kind of forces on the fluids due to the turbulence, or as people would say in the community, the viscous stress, they always set that equal to zero. Why? Well, because it's streaming in and it can't support itself. And I think that that is not a good approximation. 
Hmm. And in fact, when you look at detailed numerical simulations, so you do need numerical simulations for something, you find that setting the stress equal to zero is not a great approximation. And that's because there's no sudden change. The flow really con goes continuously over the ISO. And the magnetic fields which are present, they don't disappear. They continue exerting a stress on the fluid. And if you do model with a finite stress, then the A values that you get are significantly less than uniform. And it makes them more consistent with the gravitational radiation results. So that result actually, the fact that you're getting A always near one, particularly since one is kind of the edge of your a priorities when you do the, the analysis, you don't allow it to go say beyond one, that's crazy. Well, when you're actually doing not theory, but you're trying to understand the observations, you should let the data pick out the number that it likes best. And even allowing the stress either to be zero or to be finite already reduces that tension <laughs> significantly. So I think we can make the, the data mm -hmm. consistent mm -hmm. between gravitational radiation and this theory. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. From a question. Yeah, you're good. From a question of an expert to a question of a non expert. I'm a chemical engineer, material scientist, but I was intrigued by the equations that you put up there. Um, I have two questions, if I may. Well, one is about the time scale when you showed uh, how the, the signal decreases with time. Uh, it, if I remember the numbers, you had something like 7,000 days or some, somewhere in, in your plots, in one so, of the plots. Yeah. yeah, but so in, my question was in the other one that there was not the 7,000 days. I mean, right. This scale there, this time scale. I mean, we measure at some arbitrary time of, you know, uh, in, in not this one. If we go to the to the one to show in, the actual data and into the, the talk itself, or or yeah, you get it in the in the results as well. Yeah. Yep. No, the, the, there's the, the seven thousand, and then yeah, the data. Okay, that, that is when there was a number, but and here then the data is right. Some scale there. What what is this scale related to? I mean, what what is this time? Uh, I mean, you had another fifty six thousand, whatever that is there that you subtract. I mean, how come in in the days we measure we see such a drop in 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 the signal? I mean, if we measured, uh, you know, a few centuries later or or before, we, we see something. Yeah. So these small bits, and so they change on a time scale, which is actually compatible with the PhD project. So that's not in the fundamental equation. It's a happy coincidence. So what determines this time scale? This is what astronomers like to call a bit to the time scale. It's an engineer, a mechanical engineer, if you like, how rapidly viscosity would cause the fluid to change its profile. What they should call it, this is the time scale over which turbulence diffusion causes measurable changes in the surface density of the disk. That's what determines that from a theoretical point of view. And the observation is- 1,000 is like days then again. Yeah. Okay. So this is like between, this from here is about three years. And another question, if I may, in the in the next uh, plot that we had uh, with the with the correlation between the mass of the of the black holes, oh, and the mass mass, mass, mass yep. uh, this one. Uh, what is the characteristic of of these disks so that uh, you are very more sensitive to small masses? Is it uh, the like thickness uh, diameter uh, of the disk? Uh, for me, the, the fact that you have so many blue points down there means that it's it's you have more data, or you we yeah. see it more. We have we have so we have more data uh, just because of the statistics of how often these events occur, and you know uh, they occur that often, but we can see them fairly high up. Well, not all that different from the other materials, but the point is they occur much more frequently than. Uh, because there are more black holes in the lower. Not that characteristic of the No. 
No, although it is the, the, the fact that we can do so much work down here is because we risk a brighter than the underlying quiet and galaxies themselves. And that's what makes it, from an astronomical point of view, an interesting tool. And, you know, the observers are interested in getting at black hole populations, which are very difficult to do by other methods. Anything to add, Professor? Before I walk on the Just a follow up on uh, Spiros's question. So, in principle, could we have tidal disruption events for black holes? Not I don't care about the galaxy necessarily. For black holes that are very massive. So, if the, if they are very big, right, their 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 yeah. their event horizon is too far out, can they still disrupt the star? It's harder to do. You, you're kind of you're walking along. You're kind of skirting the edge between nothing happening at all for the star being swallowed by the pillar. And so for the bigger mass black hole, we, we, it's harder to thread that needle. The lower mass black hole is determined because you have a bigger kind of parameter space in which you would actually get kind of disruption and so yeah, that's a good question. So um, another question from someone who knows nothing about uh, astronomy. Well, I can answer those questions. <laughs> Let's try. Um, so you get a wonderful, uh, simple derivation of the Schwarzschild radius. In that you assume, though, the whole mass being a point mass. Mm. So if I assume that within the Schwarzschild radius, which I know normally people say you can't assume, you have a mass distribution, then the Schwarzschild radius could be non-homogeneous, uh, I mean, meaning it could be an, an um, ob oblate uh, object or something. Does that exist? Is it always perfectly spherical, or is it allowed to be oblate? So the derivation I gave was certainly idealized. So the, the question that you're asking is an interesting one, I mean, and it is not a naive question at all. One of the things that Roger Penrose shows is that even if you had oblate structures, if you had no net angular momentum, you could have a complicated thing with points and jet, and it would still essentially collapse down to a perfectly spherically symmetric black hole. Now, it gets interesting if the material which is doing collapsing has angular momentum associated with it, and you can't get rid of the angular momentum. Can you have angular momentum in a point like singularity? Well, that's an interesting question. And that question was answered in 1963 by Roy Kerr, who showed that there is a second type of black hole solution in addition to the perfectly symmetric Schwarzschild, spherically symmetric Schwarzschild solution. So Kerr black holes, which are actually the ones we use when we work with real data, have an oblate structure in the space-time geometry surrounding them for, I think, the reasons that you were getting at. There is structure that you can't make spherically symmetric. And it's related, the physics of it is related to angular momentum, which is preserved even when you go all the way down to the singularity. And one of the final slides, I wrote what the a parameter was, which is a measure of the whole's angular momentum. And that depended on the existence of exactly the kind of structure that you're asking about. The fact that A exists as a parameter. For a Schwarzschild black hole, A is zero in the story. But what we measure in the universe is never A equals zero. As Nick was talking about, we tend to measure embarrassingly low. We tend to measure the maximum amount that a hole can have, which probably means we're not doing something right. But even when you're careful, values of A are never zero. They're always some number between zero and one. May I do one more teaser? If uh, my, my background is quantum mechanics, experimental one. So if I was to take two black holes with different angular momentum and superimpose them, I would get would I get a, a time-dependent Schwarzschild radius? Shape? Uh eventually you might initially get a time-dependent for the gravitational radiation would probably get rid of that structure and it would eventually settle down to a steady state pretty quickly. Thanks. Yeah. Um, I have two questions. The first is, what are the input parameters? What do you fit in your model? And the second is, 
you mentioned something about turbulence. So you assume, I presume, you have fully developed turbulence in this process. Yeah. Is there an independent way of checking that? Oh, well, you, so I'll take the second question first. So the, the people have gotten extremely sophisticated with what they can model now with supercomputers. And you can measure, not measure, you can model uh, magnetohydrodynamics in disks and get details of not only turbulence, but diagnostics, power loss spectra, and so forth. So yes, you can see cascades, not over a brilliantly large scale, but enough to know that you're dealing with a, you know, with, with a turbulent system. Um, and then you were asking, what are we actually, so there are three parameters which have to do with the overall normalization and with the initial starting time and with how fast the exponential decay occurs. So those are the parameters that we fit just from the sort of early time data of the whole, and then we extrapolate out. And then for the ultraviolet part, we don't touch it. Those are predictions. Thank you very much. Uh, I think if there are no other talks, let's thank our speaker again. And, uh, thank you.